Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, you will hear a discussion with Rebecca Brando and producer John Batsek from the film Listen to Me, Marlin, honored by Landmark Theater's Director of Event Marketing, Dan Gorski, recorded at the Landmark West LA. I don't think I've ever seen uh, something quite like this in a documentary. I mean, you have so much audio, it seems like, to pull from directly from his voice. And um, it, it really gives us a unique perspective on him and you know what went through his mind, what his life was like. Um, I don't think we could have gotten that any other way. And I'm just wondering, what was that process like of going through the audio? How many hours? Did you have to work with, and and how many years did he do that for? How many how many years did we do it for? Did he did he actually record? Right, right. Uh, well, why don't we start with that? And Rebecca can answer that better than me. How many? When did your dad start the recording? Do you reckon? Well, um, okay. So Stephen Riley should really be with us tonight because he knows all the answers to these wonderful questions. And through the interviews that we've been doing for the past few months together, I've learned so much about my father. Um, listening to him because he's heard all the audio since 1950. So he's kept um, these tapes for a very long time, unbeknownst to me. I know that my dad spoke into a dictaphone for um, all my life, but I didn't ever question as to what he was saying and what he would do with these tapes. So, um, you know, after my dad passed, the estate trustees came upon a box full of audio tapes, and there were over 300 hours of them that Stephen had listened to. Yeah, so, so, so once we were given access to the tapes, I mean, you asked me how it was for me to plow through all the hundreds of hours of audio. I'm the producer. I don't, have, I don't get to do that. It's the director who has to do that. That works. <laughs> and Stephen Riley, who directed this film, who I'd made two films with previously, literally listen to every m second of those 300 hours listen to every word and uh it was a sort of monumental task but it, it was it was something that i because i'd seen the way he'd made the previous films we'd made together i knew he was that kind of a uh, um <coughs> he had that kind of those powers of concentration i tease him about being the most obsessive director i've ever worked with because that is what it required it required someone who was going to leave absolutely no stone unturned because he also read every book that's been written about marlon and, you know, when you're ta tackling a subject like that, like Marlon Brando, who one, we, people like Stephen and I knew so little about, in order to do the job we wanted to do, which was to make a properly truthful and authentic film, you have to have, you have to have your director be someone who is prepared to do that kind of work. And I knew Stephen would. And because also we have a resp I feel like as filmmakers, we have a responsibility when we tell stories about real people to the people who are part of the family uh, and to whom and who have charged you to go off and make that kind of a film you could do it it would be easy to do it in a much more superficial way but that's not what we wanted to do so he listened to everything and then how involved were you in that process I mean did they come to you often were you kind of meeting with them and seeing different cuts and in the, were you in the edit room did you get involved with any of that you know, I, I had no involvement in the process of making this film, um, but the trustees did, and they met with um, Mike Metavoy, R.J. Cutler, the other producer, met with um, Mike Metavoy, and then um, I'll let you answer the rest. <coughs> well, one of the sort of, in some respects, what, what, what has turned out to be one of the most enjoyable aspects of making this film is that once I'd met with the people who sit in charge of the, Brando Estate, to talk to them about the film that we plan to make. They opened the doors to the archive to us, and and basically no one had any say or involvement in what we chose to put in the film and what we or, or what we didn't put in the film. We had access to absolutely everything. We could have told any story that we discovered through the tapes. We met with Rebecca and we we talked them through what we planned to do, and for reasons that maybe Rebecca can answer or maybe not. They chose to trust us, all of them, in a way that, you know, I, I feel kind of proud of because because I suppose it would have been very easy to be nervous and anxious, and maybe they were both nervous and anxious, 
but they still there was something about the way we presented ourselves that made you feel it's, yeah it's very true um you know there have been countless p biographies and books written about my father and we we were very worried about this the you know who we were going to be who was going to take his most personal um you know innermost secrets which were these recordings and um we had great faith in our trustees who knew what they were doing and when we met Stephen Riley and we met John Batsick, we thought, you know, there was something about them that that we could tell that they just seemed very sen like very sensitive people. So I, we I were say in it's because we're British. That I, I did say that in New York and <laughs> people laugh, but RJ didn't, but because he's American. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so then what maybe, like, when you saw it then, what maybe was, what was your biggest surprise in watching this the first time? Let me just quickly say, the first time that Rebecca got to see it was, in fact, when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, which was incredibly brave of her and the rest of the family to wait, to, again, trust us enough to wait and to sit in a cinema with 200 people and watch this film for the first time. It was brave of you, too, to let me watch it for the first time at Sundance. But no, I, I, the first time I saw it was at Sundance, and I was very um, emotional. I, ha I actually walked out of the theater when Stephen Riley introduced me in the audience to point to an empty chair, and everyone was surprised. But then, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's really hard after 10 years of being in, um, I have to say, um, a very long grief period, and to kind of break that brief grief with watching this film um, it was, you know, imagine watching your father all of a sudden in the theater was with surround sound and he's bigger than life on the screen. So it was very emotional. But um, I went back home or back to the hotel and I um, thought about it and processed it and tried to think about it from a public's view. And I saw it again the next night and then the next night after that and realized that it was a really good film, and I was very pleased. And to my great surprise, I think it's a good, re a great relief. It's basically a perspective that needed to be seen, because there have been so many biographies done, and nothing quite like this. And it's basically unprecedented, because it's his own voice telling his own truth. And let me just quickly add to that. <laughs> <coughs> just. Just to give just a little insight to what it's like to be a producer of a film like this, I had my eyes on Rebecca through that screening and I saw her leave the auditorium. This was the first time she'd seen the film and I, I knew immediately that she must be upset or moved or emotional about the film. So I, 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 I didn't follow her immediately, but I went out myself and it, you know, my heart was sort of thumping in my chest because of course the worst nightmare when you make a film like this is to imagine that someone for whom it's incredibly important is actually really unhappy with what they've seen. So it was a, you know, it was a really, it was a very powerful moment because I went out and she was sitting by this fire out in the snow and was clearly upset. But, um, and so ultimately when, when, when she had time to process it and then see the film again and, and has become such a huge supporter of the film, it's sort of the, uh, as I said to Rebecca, she sent me a lovely email about this the other day, it is the ultimate reward for me as a documentary maker to have the people for whom it's most important to say, you know what, you did a good thing. <coughs> One of the things that really struck me about this movie was, was just, just the idea that, he, that he, it really was just him speaking what was on his mind at various points, and there were real moments of insight and perspective, I mean, I guess now we look back and it's, it's, we can see the perspective maybe in the moment he didn't, but there were little moments and there were also big moments and I'm just wondering, John, when you first saw it, did you, did you think differently, not just about him, but did you, about your own life mm -hmm. and perspective in itself? Yeah, very definitely. Um, I mean, I, I sometimes say that, that as well as being a study of a life, this is a study, this film for me is a study of life because Marlon's struggles, I mean, the highs and the lows of his life are sort of, they resonate, I think, they, they, prob they resonate for ordinary people as well because many of those things are things that we all experience, you know. I, uh, so whether it's, you know, stuff with your parents or your kids or your work or your self-esteem or whatever it is, I, you know, I, 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 I felt very conscious of a, 
an increasingly powerful connection with the travails of his life that I was witnessing. And actually, without wishing to get too morose, as we were cutting the film last summer, I lost my father. I lost Malik, who directed Searching for Sugar Man that I produced with him. He took his own life. And it became listening to Marlon struggle with these fundamental things about life. It re I really felt the power of that. And I really felt how it related to my own life and, and and actually ultimately at the same time I felt great inspiration from him because of his honesty and I think um, because of the way he bravely went about his life and lived his life and, 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 and yes as I said because he was so honest with himself or tried to be about his failings as well as his strengths and I f kind of felt like there was great learning in kind of witnessing that. Was there any access to the late, the late uh, master classes that he were, was teaching? There were, we had access to the audio, some of the audio from that. And in fact, for quite a long time, the cut of the film was caught. The, Stephen wanted to call it Lying for a Living, the movie. So he was, Stephen heard all of that stuff. And uh, he, I don't actually know which specific bits of the audio come from there. But yes, we did have access to it. And funny enough, today in my office, a guy who's been working there for, there for a long time, who works on the other side of the business, came up to me today and said, I knew Marlon. I was completely surprised to hear that. And he was a production manager of Lying for a Living. So he actually worked on that whole great big shoot. But yes, there is some of the audio in the film comes from that. So the question is about his children. It seemed uh, like this, this film talked about two of them, but the, he had more. Do you have some insight into I mean, you know, I suppose the only way to really be able to answer that, for me to be able to answer that, is that, you know, you have to make creative decisions when telling a life story. You can't tell the whole, you can't include everyone, you can't tell every aspect of a life. And I think that from the the approach that Stephen took and the, the narrative track that he wanted to take in the film, it felt to him that the story played the way he wanted it to by featuring the two kids that he did feature. Um, and like I said, you know, you have we have to make creative decisions as to what aspects of a story you're going to focus on when you're telling someone's entire life story. So it ultimately it boiled down to that. And how many siblings do you have? Uh, we are eight. Mm -hmm. Was there was there additional pieces that they did cut out that maybe will be in a DVD later on or special features, something like that? Well, there there is a there'll be a there'll be a DVD extra that is the making of and how we created the CG head and all that sort of stuff. Tell us about that head. Actually, that was kind of a really unique. I've never seen something like that. Well, as Marlon says in the film, he had his head scanned into a computer. You know, at the time which they were uh, he was imagining and they were planning to create it, it as a as CG, but that never actually happened. And Stephen found out about the original that the original scans still exist existed and Passion Pictures the company that I run the other side of the company is, is it's in fact predominantly an animation company and uh, I don't run the animation side of it but because it was an animation company Stephen had this idea of, of actually of us realizing what Marlon was so excited about which was to create his head as CG so um, because we were able to do it in-house and therefore I was able to not pay the people who did it otherwise we would never have been able to do it um, we created it and um, we, we did it at Passion and they did an amazing, ama I mean, I think they did an amazing job. And again, you know, that's one of the, th that from a point of a documentary making point of view was a huge risk because in many respects we had no idea of knowing if it was going to work and to put all that time and effort and it was a lot of time and a lot of effort and it sort of became an integral part of the film. If it hadn't worked, we would have been in trouble. And I think it plays an important piece in the film because my dad was so interested in technology, and he was always into gadgets, and I, I, I'm really glad they put that piece in there because I, I think, for instance, he bought the first Mac, which was back in the day called Macintosh, and I think it was at, in the early 80s, and he had me taking classes with like maybe two or three other people at a in a class, and I was inputting DOS code and... Um, you know, my dad was also just so interested in, it, he was such a forward thinker. Um, you know, he knew about the internet before it popped out, and um, he was also in chat rooms, and I think you could, he was cat, he was a cat, what do you call it, catfish, when you pretend you're somebody else. And he was, he pretended to be a China woman, <laughs> a woman from China. I think he called her, 
called her himself China, or Red China, or something like that. Um, <laughs> and then also, uh, he also was thinking about doing um, like web TV back in the early 90s. So he was, he was already making plans to do things on the web. Um, another thing that he did was, oh, right, he was thinking about doing um, a reality show um, using this um, device, which he often used as a prank, as a whoopee cushion. <laughs> and he wanted to use, do that with Johnny Depp, and he was thinking to do a reality, he said to Johnny, wouldn't it be fun if we could do a reality show and, and, and go to various places like Candid Camera and, and perhaps you know, go into an elevator and, and, and with a whoopee cushion and get people's reaction <laughs> and get it on film. And just imagine, you know, Marlon Brando and Johnny Depp in an elevator with a whoopee cushion. <laughs> I thought in terms of the social reality, the mm -hmm. fact that he stood with the Panthers, that he stood against the oppression of black people, he stood up for the native peoples, he stood up for all this. Mm -hmm. And it was really, it was intense, intensely important to him. You know, and I wanted to know what made you think, really, because I really think it was important that you included what you did. And the way that you presented that with such integrity and dignity mm -hmm. that it shouts out lessons to people in the world today, particularly people who are in positions similar to Marlon. Correct. What made us make those choices? I mean, what I can say is how could you make a film? Yeah, you know, because it's, it was so important to him. It was so passionately important to him. And as I said, we wanted to make a film. We wanted to make an authentic and truthful film. And so you couldn't not, you couldn't leave it out. Um, so, I mean, I'm really glad that it resonated with you as it did. It's an integral part, I mean, and you can speak much more to it, but yeah, from a filmmaking point of view, it was like, there's no way we could possibly not have touched on both of those subjects because it meant so much to him. I, um, yes, it was such a big part of his life. Um, he called himself a citizen of the planet and he, his greatest pursuit in life is to was to you know, ameliorate the world in any way he could. Um, you know, for a very long time, he he grew up with the Adler family, Stella Adler's, um, she had practically adopted him and invited um, him into her home. And, at, you know, they would sit at dinner time um, talking about politics and the Jewish state. And he learned so much from them, you know, regarding politics. Um, that you know he would m do speeches to raise money for the Jewish st state. He was involved in UNICEF. He was he he was a part of the UN. He um, like you said he did work with um, the American Indians and he uh, you know the year that after um, Dr. Martin Luther King died, he was so passionate about it that and and so fiercely moved by it that he wanted to um, stand up for. Um, go to the, oh, no, he was at the Black Panther. He wanted to speak on behalf of Bobby. Um, yes, thank you, Bobby Hutton. And he just needed to say out loud, you know, that could have been my son there. But it, it you could not make a film without mentioning what he had done as a human, human activist. So he's asking about maybe why, insights into why maybe he never went back to the theater. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, I don't have an, I don't know the answer to that. Certainly he says, doesn't he, that he sort of, he, he made a resolution which is he wanted to sort of change the nature of screen acting after having done that play. And maybe I think he felt like that's where his commitment was from that point on because that's, yeah, that's what he wanted to do. But I, I mean, that's just me making it up. I, I can't, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to speak for him. You know, I'll tell you one thing. My dad never had any of us talk about his career. He never ever wanted us to talk about um, his film, his career, or anything to do with acting. Um, it was practically taboo. Um, I remember one time I came over and he was sitting on in the living room reading the newspaper, and I came in singing, a, humming a song, "I'm Luck Be a Lady," 
Is that how, is that the title? Like be a lady. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I know that my dad loves to sing standards, and he would sing any song, all standards. He could sing anything, and he also played the piano. And uh, so I sat across from him, and I said, "Hey, Dad, have you heard that song? <laughs> Luck, be a lady tonight." <laughs> and I was all chipper and happy, and he was looking at his um, newspaper, and he just raised his eyes and just looked at me and gave me such a strong look and just returned to his paper, and I knew that I had said something regarding his work, and I couldn't say it again. So, no, we didn't talk about his work at all. So he never mentioned anything. Question about uh, a little bit more about how you wo how the, the film wove together the music and the different clips and the images you chose? I mean, that's really a question for the director, but what I would say is that, um, you know, I think Stephen wanted to create the sense that Marlon at the l in the later years of his life was looking back over his whole life and he was in Mulholland in his house, looking through the archive and sort of trawling back over his entire life. And, uh, <coughs> you know, he, he we decided and Stephen decided that we were going to shoot just not not a lot but a few inserts of from the interior of the interior of his house so we built a set in london and we shot that and but we always wanted it we, we never wanted it to be to feel like it was sort of a a completely realistic recreation we just wanted to convey the sense of the space in which he lived and i suppose in a way <coughs> i feel like with the audio what what we discovered fairly early on in 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 the editing process was it was sort of casting a spell it was almost it's almost slightly dreamlike, and we, we wanted to be able to maintain that the whole way through the film. So we didn't want to do anything stylistically that would break that spell. Um, so yeah, we shot interiors in a studio, then we sort of degraded them when we, to put them into the cut. Uh, the music, we worked with a composer called Max Richter, who's done a lot of amazing music for, um, for lots of different movies. And then, you know, the, 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 the clips, the movie clips are what they are, and it was just a question of you know, finding a balance between not overdoing the amount of movie clips that we used and, and, and con consistently maintaining that spell that is voice cast. And in some respects, that was one of the juggling acts was with all the other stuff that we put into the film. We just didn't, we wanted to make sure that you were constantly sort of being seduced by that voice and not having that spell broken. Oh, so did the audio change the way you think about your filmmaking process? I mean, it's a good question because I guess the majority of the films we make have at least a portion, sometimes quite a significant portion of talking heads. I mean, what I will say is it feels like a real privilege to be able to make a film this way with a, with, with a man like Marlon, but with all the material, all that audio that has enabled us to make a film where you don't need to have interviews. And certainly we resolved from pretty early on, once we got a sense of the audio, that we wanted to make, a f make the film and not interview anyone and literally just have it in his voice. Of course, y that's kind of a rare situation, and I can't imagine we're going to be able to repeat it necessarily. And we're making a whole bunch of other films at the moment, and they will all have talking heads in them of various <laughs> sorts. <laughs> but I would love to be in a situation again where one might have... I mean, I suppose what we were trying to do is be innovative, be progressive, and do something original and something that felt new. And I would always, and we do always want to be trying to do that. It's just a question of where does one go next? And I think it would be a mistake to just repeat that, te that technique just for the sake of repeating the technique. I think it really has to feel like it's organic to the film that you're making. And it definitely did in this instance feel like that was the way to make this film. We'll just have to see what subjects we tackle in the future and whether we have the opportunity of doing it similarly but I'd certainly like to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.